Hello everyone and welcome to the first session of seminar Anthropocene Design, Infrastructure, Imagination and Experimentation at the End with our instructor Stephanie Wakefield. The Anthropocene, our era of climatic and metaphysical upheaval, has outmoded or rendered ineffective most established most modes of living, governing and thinking. Exploring the Anthropocene as a time of both crisis and possibility, this seminar examines the political, imaginal, and infrastructural dimensions of the experimental design strategies to respond to, adapt, and overcome contemporary socio-ecological dislocations. Case studies and vignettes of urban adaptation, infrastructural Icelandization, design for autonomy, and attempted off-planet exploration will be used as jumping off points for critical analysis of crisis discourse, resilience ecology, and the back loop living infrastructure, planetary urbanization, human non-human entanglement thinking, earthbound and or glitch subjectivity, and cosmotechnics for governing or escaping existing systems, including that of the earth itself. The seminar will cover contemporary work in geography, ecology, and political theory, as well as art, film, design, and popular culture. Ultimately, will be concerned with questioning attempts by theory and design to delimit the meaning of human and non-human potentials at the time when limits themselves are withering away. Now, Stephanie Wakefield is an urban geographer whose work critically analyzes the technical, political, and philosophical transformations of urban life in the Anthropocene. She holds a PhD in Earth and Environmental Science from the CUNY Graduate Center and is currently assistant professor and director of the Human Ecology Program at Life University. Previously, she was an Urban Studies Foundation postdoctoral research fellow based at Florida International University and visiting assistant professor in the Department of Culture and Media at Eugene Lang College. She is the author of Anthropocene Backlog, Experimentation in Unsafe Operating Space and co-editor of Resilience in the Anthropocene governance and politics at the end of the world. She recently completed a new book, The City and the Anthropocene, Resilience, Infrastructure and Imagination at Miami's End, which critically explores experimental sea rise adaptations in Miami, Florida, and throughout this, suggests new limits and possibilities for critical urban theory and practice in the age of climate change. Now, I'm gonna pass the mic to Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. It's it's really cool to meet you uh, and to be here. This is the first time I've done a class with the new center. Um, so it's the whole format and everything. Uh, it's very new to me. So you'll have to kind of fill me in on how this all works and how you do things. Um, but I'm really excited to, to meet all of you and see what you're thinking and working on. Um, and I'll ask you guys to do introductions in just a second so I can learn about that and we can all learn about that now. Um, and so so what I'd like to do today is just talk a little bit about, you know, who everyone is here, what you're interested in and, and how we can kind of shape the seminar in a way that will be most, you know, useful to you and interesting to you. Um, and talk a bit about the class format and topics. Um, and so I'll say a few things about that first right now, then we'll do introductions. And then at the end, I'll do a bit of a, a talk about um, just sort of the main framing that I'd like us to, you know, hold in mind as we explore more specific topics going down um, through the, the eight weeks that we have together. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the Anthropocene, the adaptive cycle and sort of the big picture sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, in general, I think this is a is kind of an exciting seminar we have here because we can kind of take it in a lot of directions. What I'd like us to broadly look at um, and what I have put out in the syllabus for you guys right now, which by the way, I updated yesterday. Um, I don't know if you, I hope you all saw that. I put a little uh, change of date in there because I have a new guest um, interlocutor that will be joining us um, towards the end. And so I moved a few things around to, to fit him in. Um, but so what I've kind of, tentatively laid out in the syllabus for us is uh, eight weeks of looking at some of the responses, particularly in the realm of design and infrastructure, to the sort of dislocations of the Anthropocene that we are seeing all around us right now. The, the effects of climate change, 
sea level rise, things like that, but also attempts to respond to the, um, you know, the, 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 the problems that different people see the Anthropocene as posing for thought, for art, for creation, for all of those realms, for ontology even, um, in their own ways, right? So I wanna look at these different responses, particularly as they're playing out in design and infrastructure, um, because that has been, those, those areas have been such a privileged realm, uh, you know, of, of, of response to what we're seeing unfold around us. Um, and there, there's such, infrastructure in particular is such an interesting vector, I think, um, to look at, because we don't just look at, um, you know, a tool or a technology when we look at infrastructure, right? We're looking at um, practices that, that humans create to respond to their worlds, to engage with their worlds. We're looking at poetics. We're looking at ideas of the future. We're looking at ways of foreclosing other futures. We're, we're looking at ways of controlling people and environments or trying to get out of the control that is already placed on a, a people or an environment, right? So, so infrastructure is such a cool uh, uh, entry point into huge questions, really diverse questions of, of what's happening um, in the Anthropocene uh, around us. So, so week by week, I've kind of laid out um, a couple of different areas of focus in the syllabus for us to, to, to explore what we might call Anthropocene infrastructure or Anthropocene design. Um, and I, it's roughly structured around first sort of cities, urbanization and the resilience paradigm. But then, because that, that so uh, to, to say a little bit about myself and my background, um, I, that is what I've studied for, I don't know, for like a really long time now, for over a decade. <laughs> uh, and and for, for a while it felt like resilience, urban resilience, urban resilience infrastructure was sort of the, the end all and be all, or at least that's how it was spoken about that these, this paradigm was the end all and be all of uh, coastal adaptation, of urban adaptation to climate change and so on. But I think what we're seeing in the last couple of years, particularly since COVID, since 2020, um, is a shift possibly beyond resilience, a sort of post-resilience paradigm emerging too. And this is what I've been tracking in my new research um, and, I, and I'm just kind of piecing that together right now. So I'd like to then push beyond resilience, not just stop there, but actually see that as maybe just one moment on a, on a broader continuum that is in no way coherent or linear, right? Of, of adaptive responses to the Anthropocene and to climate change in particular. Um, and so there we're gonna move into this sort of post-resilience discussion of endings, of delinking and disconnection, of closing up cities, which is being discussed in, in some quarters, in some places, of climate refuge cities, um, and also uh, a recent discussion of the idea of design for closure or for depresencing that um, some, some researchers and practitioner, practitioners in France are working on. Um, and here I, I'm speaking about Alexander Monin and, and some work that he and some of his colleagues are doing over there. And I, I, I find that to be a really interesting um, provocation, what, what they're working on there. It's a very interesting provocation to resilience thinking because they're, they're suggesting that design should not be or cannot only be a matter of creation and bringing to presence now. M-O-N-N-I-N, yeah. It's on the syllabus, I think in week five. Let me, t let me tell you, I'll, I'll go through the syllabus a little bit more closely in, in just a moment. Um, week four, week four, um, Alexander Monin, week four. And so I've asked him to come join us and have a conversation with us in that week, week four, um, because I, I find his work very interesting. And I, I think it would be a really interesting provocation for us to um, have a, a brief pre presentation from him on what they're doing there around design for depresencing, for closure, for endings rather than simply creation and resilience and continuation of what is. Um, they're doing a lot of work um, on the conceptual and theoretical level around these questions, engaging with design thinking and philosophy and, and sort of Anthropocene critical theory. But they're also um, working on some very interesting projects um, in a, a graduate program at, uh, at ESC Claremont, uh, working on the practical uh, strategies for um, design for, for, for closure and for ending. So it's a very interesting project that weds um, theory and practice, you know, which is great uh, and much needed. So, so we'll have a nice little guest visit with him on uh, week four to kind of explore what are the different valences of 
this post resilience kind of turn that I think we're seeing. And, and by the way, that's one of the arguments I'm going to be trying to make in this seminar that we are in a potential post resilience turn. Um, <clears throat> and what I'll be saying, what, what I think we're seeing there, and what I'll be suggesting in the seminar is that obviously this doesn't replace this resiliency framework at all that, that is so dominant. I mean, I'm sure you all in your own areas of research and practice and life see resilience you know, as a discourse and a, and a, and a mode of um, action everywhere you go. You know, I mean, it's, it is very dominant. So I'm not suggesting that this is being replaced, but that maybe an, another pathway is being opened alongside it that maybe is in some ways contradictory with resiliency thinking. Um, and I think that there are potentially really obviously dark, nefarious, horrific uh, possible horizons for that turn and also very, very interesting, potentially transformative ones too. In, uh, and so I wanna break down some of those, those trajectories. Um, but then also we'll be kind of making a little swerve at the end after that um, to look at, on the one hand, some, some theoretical responses to the Anthropocene um, that really focus on you know, rethinking human being, sort of entanglement more than human thinking. And I want us to approach those critically um, it, it, as with all the, the topics that we're gonna look at in the seminar. Um, I want us to look at sort of what's often seen as, you know, the sort of cutting edge of critical theory for our moment, for the age of climate change, you know, and to ask, you know, what is it setting up as a must for human life at this moment? And what is it foreclosing for human life at these moments um, where maybe, you know, if it's true, as we will discuss in the seminar that the Anthropocene does, um, you know, represent a moment where the limits on, you know, certain definitions of human life are coming undone and um, on, on human and non-human life are coming undone. Do we need to be setting up more limits, but we might want to ask instead, you know, do we need to be keeping um, those, those, those parameters open instead? So anyway, we'll be looking at some of that theory um, later on. And then we'll also have one other guest visit from Caroline Busta. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with her work but she is the founder, co-founder of the New Models um, Project, which is, a, in, in my opinion, a really incredibly interesting um, online project, uh, IRL and online project that brings together um, uh, sort of web two and web three uh, technologies and approaches. And she's gonna talk, we're gonna also have sort of a, um, a structured conversation together. And she will talk about what she's working on and how she sees, um, the, you know, the transformations of, um, you know, sort of, uh, well, in the art world, the transformation she's seeing in terms of discourse and aesthetics and um, uh, uh, practice around um, Web3 and what are the potential um, horizons for that. So she's going to talk about channel also, which she's, is another project she's working on that you may be familiar with. Um, in any case, that is sort of where we're going to end. And then we'll have our presentations. So that brings me to the more like nitty gritty of all this. Uh, it's going to be a very straightforward um, seminar. Basically, we will have week by week uh, these meetings where I will talk for a while, but I will not talk too long because I don't want to just bore you to death. Um, so I will talk for a while and then we'll leave a lot of space for uh, discussion, questions, thoughts, conversation. Um, Cause that seems to me, I mean, like I said, this, the new center is new to me, but that seems like one of the very cool things that we get to do here um, is talk across very different contexts because I know you're all coming from different places um, and we all bring very different um, backgrounds and expertise to these topics. So I wanna make sure we have a lot of time for discussion. Um, so that's how most of the sessions will go. Um, and we do need to do those um, reading presentations. So we'll do those at the beginning. Um, so we'll just go ahead and have you um, pick this week at the end of this class, um, which week you'd like to present on and with whom. We'll set that up as a schedule. And then we'll kick off each meeting with those presentations. So, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, present one of the readings. Um, and then that will be our jumping off point for the broader conversation. And then uh, the only other requirement for, for you guys beyond those presentations and, you know, attending and discussing is um, that in the final uh, week, we have that final um, project that you will turn in. And that's either a paper or a video project. Um, where, and we'll talk about the details of those a bit more later, but what I'd like you to do um, is to explore one of the topics, one of the case studies, one of the concepts, it's up to you, that we cover in the seminar, 
um, you know, on your on your own terms, in your own medium. That's it's very very open uh, as far as I see it, and we can talk about those if you have questions about how to kind of plan out and design the project. Um, I'm happy to help you with those for sure. And so I've set aside time in the last week, week eight, for you guys to share um, your drafts of those uh, with everyone and get feedback and, and and things like that. Because this is a cool opportunity for potentially coming up with something publishable too that, that could be um, put out for a broader public. Um, and I think that's it. Logistically, those are just the, the basic things. And then we'll be here you know, each week, um, 9 a.m. Uh, why don't we... Before I kind of go into the the bigger kind of like thoughts and concepts of the class, and I'm gonna give you a little PowerPoint so we can talk about imagery too. Um, why don't we just do introductions? Because that will really help me to have a sense of where you guys are coming from and and how to sort of situate the class. Um, I will just say uh, about myself that um, so I am I've been doing academic research on urban resilience and coastal. Um, experimental adaptations to sea level rise for about 15 years. I spent uh, most of my life in New York City, well, actually in Queens, uh, but um, studying post Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, um, resiliency infrastructure. Um, we'll talk about a bit of that later in the, in the class. Um, and then most recently I, I have been living in Miami, Florida, where I was um, beginning a new project on sea level rise experiments there. In, climate change ground zero in the United States um, and Bitcoin ground zero also in the United States. Uh, so it's a very interesting place that we'll also talk about as an interesting case study. Um, and I'm currently in Atlanta where I'm doing this work on um, climate refuge cities. So that's that's a part of what I, I have done you know, academically, but I've also um, done a lot of work that kind of crosses over into arts, into the art, art collaborations. Um, and I have also done a lot of projects outside of the academy that are about trying to develop um, infrastructure for autonomy in, in the Anthropocene, in an age of um, you know, sort of social and environmental um, conflict and, and, and unraveling. So I, I've been engaged in academic pursuits as well as these sort of material infrastructural questions. And I think that these are both really interesting areas of investigation. Um, I also I have a little website, Backloop TV, um, where I put uh, video and um, rough you know photos from my research um so and i also and that's that's just a side project but i'm also really interested in um questions of the imagination as they thread through resiliency infrastructure and design so that's a that's a theme i'd like us to look at a lot also in the seminar so anyway that's a little bit about me why don't we just do a go around um uh, i guess everyone can just volunteer themselves is that the best way to do this alfredo you think yeah, I think that works. Yeah, um, maybe if you could just tell us a little bit, you know, your name, uh, maybe where you're based, what your um, what your situation is with the new school, if you're, or, sorry, new center, uh, if you're um, certificate or, or or what program you're in, um, and you know what your what your interests and background are, what you if you have areas of experience that you would like to bring to the class um, or. And then also what you're interested in, why, why you're in the class, because that will really help me. I'd like to shape this to be as relevant to you as possible. I can start? Yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone. And hello, Stephanie. Nice to meet you. Um, my name is Alberto Ponce. I'm a Chilean writer. I'm based on in Santiago de Chile right now. And uh, I'm a certificate student of the philosophy, critical philosophy program here in the New Center. And currently I work in a department of design in Universidad, Universidad Católica de Chile. I'm in a research about uh, aging and artificial intelligence. So it's my first time to study something uh, about the Anthropocene and design, but it's, uh, it's really interesting for me. And I think it's gonna be a really, um, I don't know how to say useful because I'm really interested in, in things about uh, the ethics of care and and it, that thing. And I think it's, it's, it's really interconnected with the Anthropocene and the things you, you put in, in, your, in the syllabus. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome, it's great to meet you. That's such an interesting area of research that you're involved in, AI and aging. I'm, I'm super interested in that as well. I mean, one of the things that I'm gonna really emphasize is that 
the way I think about the Anthropocene is not just climate change and not just an environmental thing, right? So, and I'll talk about this a bit more, but I, I have always thought the Anthropocene was useful because it's this term that describes so much that we are living through of this epoch of these epochal transformations, epochal um, moments of collapse, but dislocation, but also opening. And th this rise of AI is so much a part of that and, and algorithmic subjectivity and all that. I mean, the way hu human uh, minds and being is being reshaped right now, I think is part and parcel with um, what we're seeing in the, the so-called natural world. So I, I would love if you have, you know, any thoughts to bring that in? Because I think that's very interesting. Cool, thank you. Cool, would somebody else like to just uh, pop on? Can, go. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, hi, my name is Nima and I am from Iran. Right now I'm in Boulder, Colorado. I have a background in studio art. Uh, I got my MFA from UT Austin. Now I'm doing my PhD in critical media practice here at Sea Boulder. And I am interested in desert and I look at the desert as a, like a future landscape. And, and my practice is based on fragmented element that I can find in desert. And instead of representing them, go through transposing and transforming them and create a new narrative around them and to see how we can practice with the fragmented element in the future. And I am interested in this seminar because <clears throat> I'm interested in the fiction and how human create a fiction uh, to justify the present and the future. And I want to see that how this like uh, nice curated list of reading can kind of <laughs> inform me about this sort of and also want to listen because my experience here at the, the news center is very interesting because i mostly listen instead of talking and these like fragmented thoughts also very helpful for me how like we live in this <laughs> world <laughs> yeah and i'm also part of art and curatorial practice certificate yeah thanks cool thank you it's great to meet you that's super interesting too okay this is already great i, I love hearing what you guys are working on um, I mean, the desert is always right, like the figure of the the nightmare of capitalism covering the world. The, you know, the desert grows. You know, but but in the desert, there's you know salvation, right? The idea that there's um, that you can abandon the city, go to the desert, plant a garden, make it thrive. You know, there's so many. I mean, I'm sure that you 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 work with these, but there are so many uses of the desert. And I mean, I I have this little PowerPoint that we're going to look at in a minute, just to kind of situate ourselves with the Anthropocene. I mean, and it's so many of the images that you get um, to convey what is happening with the Anthropocene look like desert. You know, they might be trash, but they look like desert. It's the desert growing uh, all around us. That's that's super interesting. Um, cool. Would anyone else like to to go? I can volunteer myself. Um... Hello, my name is Richard. Uh, it's very nice to meet you. Um, uh, this course is kind of, I'm a certificate student, I think in the post-planetary universal design course, but I'm not entirely sure. I understand that it's quite loose. Um, my, this course, this kind of seminar in particular is like a, uh, an amazingly precise synthesis of all the things I've been working on for about 10 years, uh, as I'm sure it is for you, obviously. Um, so the, I was originally a composer, um, and the last project I did was a kind of an opera where there was a character who decided to turn all the decisions in her life over to the control of algorithms as a way of kind of generating an infinite novelty. And she was, um, and she eventually kind of tries to like organize all the information in the world into um, a sense of kind of a, a life um, and produce that kind of coherence. I decided I wasn't interested in opera anymore. So I decided to kind of defictionalize the thing and try to do it in my own life. Uh, uh, which is tricky and extremely weird. Uh, and then I wrote some, a couple of books about far right politics, uh, one of which called The Rise of Ecofascism, it's about climate change and, and, and far right politics. Uh, and now what I'm doing is, is I'm writing a, about um, political theories given collapse, like so taking collapse as a, as a kind of a possibility, as like a, a kind of a, a political situation, 
and they're thinking uh, in the most kind of succinct summary, um, what would it be like to sustain elements of the utopian tradition uh, despite collapse or like think collapse and utopia together or think about the ways in which um, political orders, sorts of purpose, morality, even ethics and political structure in general is constituted by previous collapses and they kind of constitute in collapse as well as a, as a kind of a endless um, changing thing or something. Uh, yeah, I also know Carly, so I'm, I'm interested to see what she contributes to this. Uh, kind of, um, yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, I'm really happy to. Hear. Awesome. Yeah, that's super interesting. Carly, Carly Busta, who, who will join us later, is in my opinion, one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. I've known her an incredibly long time and she's just a damn genius. So I, and I love always seeing what she's doing because it's it's new every week and she's always ahead of everyone. Um, uh, it's, so I have some questions for you. Wait, so first of all, it's Richard, yes? Richard, yeah? Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I write under a student called uh, so, Sam Moore. So did you join them for the podcast on this book? Yeah, I was on, yeah, they did the interview. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, yeah. So I, I listened to that. That was super interesting. I, I'm excited to read this book. It sounds really um, great. Oh, that was a great podcast. Um, it was. They were very good interviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I, I was very interested in, in your work from that. Um, so let me ask you. So you said before that, that you turned the opera uh, premise of giving control of your life to algorithms. Uh, mm. You made that your own life. Right, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So so what I did was kind of collect uh, enormous amounts of information about myself. Um, I have uh, still have this kind of this app that asks me what I'm doing all the time. Uh, and every time I pick up my phone, I just tell it what I've been doing. Uh, and that is coordinated with all the kind of other digital traces that I leave, most of which I record in some fashion or other. Um, my laptop was stolen yesterday. But on that laptop, there was a um, uh, eventually a thing that was kind of collecting like a log level, um, just description of what the computer was doing all the time and producing and putting that onto the cloud. And so these information about the kind of crude high level information about what I'm doing is then transformed into um is, is kind of correlated with that information um and then the question is how then you have a kind of sense of what you're doing all the time and the question is like how to um apply some sort of transformation to that set that, that kind of sequence of activities in such a way as to generate a kind of infinite degree of, of novelty so for example you could think about um a kind of a markov network of um which is which is a network of like i'm sure you know this is like 12 people um uh, a network of of given a certain state, what is the likelihood of transforming into a certain other state? So like in kind of daily activities, that's very obvious. Like, you know, I, I get up uh, and I brush my teeth first thing, but I, I almost never like get up and do gardening first thing, right? So the, there's kind of different frequencies there. And so the question is like, how can you impose a kind of transformation onto that set of probabilities that any given activity will succeed any other given activity? Almost as if one was like dealing with a kind of a tone row in classical music composition or dealing with a collection of kind of, uh, this, and, and this is a kind of a, in some ways, a way of getting towards uh, an almost, I hoped, uh, sort of alien rationality, right, that was kind of um, composing itself. Uh, but I, eventually what happened is I, I ran out of technical capability um, and just, and like also there was a pressing historical situation that I had to think about uh, with the far right in the UK and, like and also globally. So yeah, I just kind of faded out. <laughs> okay, that's really interesting. So, okay, uh, I'm going to ask you more about that later, uh, but I'll, I'll put it on pause for now. Um, cool. How about, let's see, who would like to go next? Um, I have a question, actually. What are fire politics? I haven't heard of the term. It, is this a question it's, for me or is this for, for, for Richard? It's for Richard because he mentioned fire politics and um, sorry. Far right politics. Sorry? Far right politics. Far right. Okay, okay, okay. I was wondering what sorry, fire I, I, politics I, I just mumble all the time. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's all right. No, it's, a, uh, it's a great question and like always feel free to just interrupt me or anyone and ask. <laughs> it's hard to hear sometimes on here. And yeah. speaking of the far right, I would just like to say that I think that's a theme, not that I want to talk about all the time, but that is is really, really relevant for our conversation. Um, I've been having some discussions here over the last couple of weeks about how it's astonishing how much the far right is really dominating um, 
the critical response to the sort of green austerity that we're maybe seeing in some places. Um, and I think this is an area that is really, really um, important to kind of push back on. So just as a, a flag, that might be something to, to keep in mind as, as we, you know, as we see the news, as we see, you know, the internet and then talk over the coming weeks. But in any way, let's 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 continue our introductions. Who would like to go next? No, maybe I could go. Sorry, Emma, you can go. No, I go, can go after you. Okay. Um, I'm Ancha. I'm based in Mumbai right now. And um, what else? Uh, I'm I'm a certificate student at the new center. Um, and my background is in architecture and a little bit of contemporary visual arts because I've been working as um, a project manager and coordinator for like basically like exhibition design for art projects. Um, and it's very interesting to be in a part of this seminar because I've heard this term Anthropocene being thrown around casually almost everywhere in the art world like every curator every second artist is they have their <laughs> own um, understanding interpretation um, of the term which is which is totally fine but um yeah it, it also um i feel it opens up many more questions than the answers that come out of it um yeah, and I also did this um, workshop recently with Bern Scherer, who's um, the director of the HKW. So, uh, and he's designed something called the Anthropocene curriculum, which is really interesting because um, what they're doing is um, conducting a whole web of researchers based around the Anthropocene in the America, but they're so, um, transdisciplinary, it's not limited to just research as we know it. They're involving communities and they're involving um, real stakeholders across different sites. And I think they've picked up one of the rivers in America, I think the Mississippi, if I'm not wrong. And so the research is actually all across the river. So yeah, I mean, um, I'm excited for the program and to see where this goes. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Um, and yeah, I, I share your your sense that the Anthropocene just became this like word that was like on every grant and every art exhibition and every like anything uh, since it started in 2014. It was horrible. <laughs> and then I think that it's peaked in its past now. And now it's like it's over, I think. Uh, and I only use it because it's a quick, quick um, shorthand to describe this massive historical moment that is um, playing out in the environmental and the, the social realms. You know, I, I think it's a quick shorthand for that. Um, when, when it really kind of became that hot buzzword in, I think, 2013, 2014, um, I had been using it in some of my, uh, you know, political practice for, for a while to, to try to make an opening. I thought it was a term that could give us an opening. Um, and I'll say more about that in a little bit. Um, I don't necessarily think that anymore. So I, I will I will talk about that too because I think we've seen a changing, you know, a, as the term has been used more and more, and it's been um, developed by people in different uh, disciplines and in different fields. Um, we've you know it, it's taken on new meaning, and that's one of the things I really want us to talk about in this class too is these problematizations. That's the word that I, I tend to use. These ways of problematizing what the Anthropocene means, what climate change means in this place for these people, you know, and there, there are so many different problematizations happening right now that we don't often think about as being particular constructions of a reality, right, of a future. Uh, you know, um, like Nemo was saying, these, these, these future imaginaries, they are constructed, right, and we, and we need to step back and think about that all the time, and the Anthropocene has given birth to many, many of these, which are often portrayed as necessary and natural, when in reality, there could have been many other different responses to the Anthropocene. Um, you know, it could have been far more earth shattering. And I think that's what the scientists who proposed this term actually wanted it to be. Um, in any case, yeah. Um, cool, great to meet you. Who would like yeah, to go next? Thank you. I can go. Um, so I'm Emma. Um, 
And I'm part of the Postplanetary Universal Design Certificate. Um, I'm still in my undergrad in architecture. So a lot of um, just even practice at discussing some of these like very dense subjects. Like I really invite the practice of that because I, I haven't had all that much um, like exposure to some of these things. And my background or experience that I've had um, a little bit of like urban food deserts. Um, I have a lot of background in play. I like where imagination and play can meet design. Um, and I'm also working, I've been working on it for a little too long. Um, but one of these days, this comic book will get done. Um, and it's a lot about like off planet exploration and what we have to do when we don't really have a good option. Um, and there's a bit of like a morality, but I'm trying to make it, um, it's really a practical story and I'm trying to make it much more theoretical and involved, like just mix a lot more complicated ideas. Um, so I'm excited for a lot of, just even in the seminars um, description, I just know will be so valuable to be exposed to. Um, and then, I think design every, um, I just like to really absorb a lot of design solutions because I, I keep trying to figure out how to mix the practical and whimsical um, just as professionally, um, like playfully, you know, just to try to have all of these interests kind of hold space together. Um, but yeah, I guess that's it. And I'm in, um, a really tiny town in California. So it's 6 a.m. when I start this, but so if I'm ever like, sorry. <laughs> no worries. I understand that's super early. <laughs> um, it's great to meet you. And yeah, your comic sounds awesome. I would uh, I would love to see it. I, uh, but don't rush. Like we we always rush way too much and think like it's taking too long. This is, this is the way to live. We did, it's not necessary, you know? Um, I, yeah, I'm also really interested in the, the off planetary design question, uh, you know, and this turn towards space colonization that has also ramped up um, in the last couple of years, you know, as things are getting a little bit more chaotic on earth. Um, and then I'm also, I'm, you know, I'm interested in, obviously there are, you know, these sort of very, very corporation controlled, billionaire controlled escape pod kind of versions of that. But I'm also interested in questioning kind of the, the, the tendency of left liberal um, critiques critics uh to say that there's nothing worthy in in this um possibility of space exploration um i was raised uh watching star trek i'm like i'm a huge nerd and i think there's something about that that's like deep in my psyche now um you know i i, I this is connected to a broader critique that i would like to kind of unfold throughout the seminar of this i think there's a there's a widespread tendency to say we we should throw out human hubris. We should throw out, you know, human agency as if these were, you know, uh, a homogenous single relic of the, the modern era and of, of modern man, right? And that we should now humble human being and sort of have a, this, this, you know, uh, you know, more horizontal world of the human amidst the things of the world, right? The non-human things of the world. Um, and and I, I really want to at least ask us to question these narratives because, you know, there are many forms of human hubris, you know, space exploration, the desire to, to explore, to see what is out there, to try other spheres of living, spaces of living. I mean, these are, these are part of human existence and they don't have one form they don't have one ethics, they have many, right? Many possible ones. And so like, like any other kind of infrastructural experiment that may be underway right now, I think that they're, they're a, battle, a battlefield, right? Um, made up of, you know, good and bad, you know, evil and, and you know, maybe uncoded trajectories, right? And I, and I want us to be able to always see that in, in, in any of these kind of things. So yeah, anyway, your comic sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and it's great to meet you. Um, who would like to go next? I think you may be muted. See, or, I think you've been trying, yeah. Because I know you were trying to speak up earlier, but we couldn't hear you actually.
Yeah, because your your mute button. Oh, there you go. Yep, we can hear you now. Oh no, it was just for. We did for a second when you took out the ear earphones or something. I think that the earphones uh, have a microphone, and that microphone is like very close to. I mean, just disconnect the Bluetooth, maybe. Um. Yeah, we heard that. Yes, see, I think you can go ahead. Uh, so you can hear me, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just typing like, sorry, guys, maybe you, you guys go ahead out and work out my setting and blah, blah, blah. So, <laughs> no, yeah. No uh, yeah, um, I, I kind of want to like refund that Hubert thing a little bit. So I remember there's a very sort of interesting conversation between uh, Ashim Bambe and uh, Stigler, and they were talking, I, I'll put the link in the chat later. So they, they kind of like, kind of during that uh, conversation, the main sort of thing that they discussed is this, uh, what, what kind of hubris uh, do we have currently in this sort of technological era? So yeah, I'm just thinking of that. And yeah, so my name is Z, it's uh, spelled Z-I and uh, um, I'm a research and artist. I'm currently based in London um, and I graduate from the visual cultures department in Goldsmiths. And uh, um, I think most of my past uh, works has been, I've been working through working around working with decolonial theory and the notion of racial capitalism or racial capitalism and other like <laughs> uh, ramification of Anthropocene. Um, which I, I still find quite sort of generative in talking about the current sort of uh, like multi scala issues. And uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm also like currently writing a sort of theory fiction or whatever that means, um, like kind of based on my own uh, sort of experience and also based on uh, Shanda Ferranti's uh, psychosomatic theory. Um, but my main sort of project is, uh, is a, a theorization and like a visualization of the entwined um, acosophical violence in certain configurations in the South South con configurations. So, for example, in um, China's engagement with uh, African countries and regions and also its engagement with um, some Latin American countries and regions and this very much entwined uh, socio-environmental and also ethical issues that ha have been generated and still been generating and, and also some speculations on like possible resilient um, tactics, logics, affects that can be probably mobilized or devised in, in a way in nullifying this kind of oppressive um, power relation or false regimes. Um, yeah, so I, I find my sort of current uh, research interest um, reverberate quite strongly with um, a lot of things that, that's gonna be covered. Um, in the seminar, like um, like the notion of in infrastructure, um, also like tangible, intangible infrastructure, social, cultural sort of infrastructure or ecological infrastructure, and like governmentality and sort of alternative biopolitical paradigms, something like that. And yeah, I'm 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 very looking forward to. Um, engage in this exchange uh, flow or perhaps collisions of ideas and thoughts in the um, coming few weeks. Yeah. Awesome. It's great to meet you. It sounds like you have so many really cool areas uh, of overlap with, with some of the themes we're going to talk about. Um, yeah. We, we, you mentioned just to say one thing about one of those uh, with resilience, I think we can, oh, and we're going to talk about resilience in depth next week, um, but we see it everywhere. And, you know, there's so many um, critical things we can say about it. Um, we could say that it is the most nefarious of all biopolitical neoliberal uh, 
you know, regimes, we could say that, but we can also always see that there are so many different things that resilience can mean, um, or being resilient or developing resilient capacities. There are so many different things that that could mean. And the term I think is very like plastic and malleable. Um, and so, um, and, and if we look around at what people, you know, ordinary people are doing with the term or under the, the heading of that term, we see very different meanings and very different um, aspirations being called resilience. You know, so it's a it's an open term, like so many. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, like it's kind of like sometimes used sort of interchangeably, like insurgent or like being the insurgents. Uh, yeah, sometimes I think I am using insurgents or insurgent more. I mean, sometimes it can be like a forced resilience, like a very sort of top down a bit oppressive kind of, yeah, kind of something forced upon the commons or forced upon civilians. Like you have to live with a sense of resilience. And yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, I think I think some of the best work on, on resilience, critical work um, on resilience as, as this um, sort of latest regime of, of neoliberalism um, is the work of Julian Reed. I don't know if any of you have read his work. I, I think I included it as, um, a suggested reading in the syllabus for next week. Um, but if you're if you're interested in questions like this, like what does resilience mean? How does it reshape human subjectivity? What does it ask of us? What does it do to us as human beings? I highly recommend reading his work. It was it was super influential to me, and I think it gets at the heart of what's going on um, with resilience as a motive of government, at least that critical angle. So that's that I recommend that. Um, and by the way, let, I, I should have said this earlier, but um, before we're done here, we have to pick um, who wants to present which readings, right? So um, maybe that's something we're thinking about as we're kind of chatting and, and going through all this. Think about, yeah, if that's some, if resilience, for example, is a topic you're really interested in and, and, and the different critiques of it, that might be a week to choose to, to present on. Um, and also what I've done in the syllabus is I have um, just the main readings and then I, in many weeks, suggested readings that's just in case you're interested. But if one of those is the one you would prefer to present on, that's totally fine with me. So you can pick from either of those lists, that's fine. Um, or, and also if you're ever looking for more things to read or watch or, or, or whatever on a particular topic that we cover, just ask me, I'm very happy to, to send any suggestions. Okay, cool. Let's move on. Who would like to go next? Can I oh. Oh, oh, sorry. You go first. Okay. Um, my name is Alexandra. Um, I'm an architect and urban planner from Crimea. Um, I graduated from uh, Prototype in Future Cities Master Program, uh, where I first uh, read about um, assemblage theory, and uh, I was really fascinated and made uh, some project about. Uh, cooperating between algae and human. And uh, the reason why I'm interested in this seminar is because um, I was uh, at the last year of terraforming program by Benjamin Bratton, uh, which was canceled. And uh, the last topic before canceling was uh, synthetic materialism. Uh, we read texts uh, at, such as mushrooms at the end of the world uh, and contaminating uh, the red planet and some um, some texts about biosphere project. Uh, so, and, and I'm still trying to develop some uh, projects on based on that research uh, with my group. Uh, so I'm really interested um, in anything connected with this topic. Awesome, it's great to meet you. And I, I think um, you'll be really interested in the topic of living infrastructure that we're going to look at next week. Um, this is where I've done a lot of research um, on this sort of rise of a new thinking of infrastructure as um, biological life processes um, or natural processes. Um, and they're, they're sort of being now really heralded for their ability to um, you know, govern the effects of climate change on cities or urban systems. So um, that might be really relevant for, for your work. Um, and we'll talk about some examples of that, like the use of oysters, the use of wetlands and, and um, 
whole ecosystems um, to try to field climate change events. Cool, okay, let's keep going. Oh, by the way, I know that somebody from the um, auditor section asked if they could um, talk, but they're blocked. Can they, can they talk or they can only listen? Yeah, so by default, they cannot join either a voice or video channels, but they should be able to join us throughout the chat. Okay. Um, but there's something blocking this, which I'm currently trying to fix. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. All right. We have a few more folks to introduce themselves. Hello. Hello, uh, I'm Chen. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong, also based in Hong Kong. Uh, I am a certificate student at the Post Planetary Universal Design Program. Uh, throughout the new center seminars, I've been uh, looking into the topic of uh, the cycles of developments and destructions of a city. Um, the terms I'm currently using are life and death. Uh, I'm relating to Hong Kong, of course, and uh, uh, so I uh, currently is I'm I'm working uh, in the format of like a speculative fiction or yeah, theory text. Um, yeah, so I hope to yeah I'm interested in this seminar because I feel like I could get something inspiring from here to add on to um this project that i hope to further develop yeah awesome it's it's great to meet you and i mean in terms of um uh infrastructures and practices for autonomy there's been amazing things coming from hong kong obviously for the last several years that have circulated around the world and that's uh it's it's been incredible to see um and to to, to borrow from and to learn from um for for people in other places but yeah i, I have a question could you say more about what your interest is in the, the 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 destruction of the city question because that's also very interesting to me and that's a topic we'll look at ah uh, okay um well <laughs> i i try to make myself clear i i'm thinking because uh, well i think the beginning of why i thought up, uh, about this question is everybody says uh, the city is dying kind of but uh, when you think about it, uh, when you actually live in a city that everybody is still working, things are functioning. So I start to wonder what exactly means when a city dies. Um, um, I guess I'm more interested in the city as a community or an organization rather than like all the infrastructure, the buildings, the high rises. Yeah, so yeah, I don't, yeah, that's what what I'm at at the moment. No, that's that's a that's a beautiful question. I think that's really interesting. Um, so in, I believe week three, we're going to be looking at the question of herbicide in the Anthropocene, like the killing of cities, the destruction of cities. Um, it's a term that's been used by um different different writers to describe often military destruction of cities, right? Like a place like Baghdad or or what have you, um. Uh, or in Israel or American, you know, uh, other other military campaigns by the American military. Um, uh, or it's also been used to describe the sort of creative destruction of urban development and gentrification and of, of sort of urbanization more generally. But I, I have been writing about it recently um, in the context of the Anthropocene, um, looking at some some proposals and visions in Miami to actually just like bulldoze the city um, entirely and to use it as fill to build elevated islands to deal with flooding and sea level rise. Um, and it's, I think this is a really interesting question um, because it's, you, you know, when you propose that we should just end a certain city because it can't be resilient anymore, you're not only proposing, like you said, the destruction of the, the buildings or the roads or the, you know, that just physical makeup, you're also proposing the destruction of the, the life ways there you know, the, the futures there, all of those more intangible elements that or what, you know, um, Abdul Malik Simone might call like the, the people is infrastructure, all those sort of like rhythms of, of the life of a city. Um, and I think that's a, it's a really interesting question because more and more we're seeing in the media and in sort of academic commentary, these suggestions that some coastal cities are not viable 
because of climate change, right? And that they should be packed up and ended, right? Preemptively. And then the people relocated elsewhere. So the question of what does it mean to end a city is, is like super contemporary. Um, so yeah, that sounds like really interesting work. And I think that week three might be really interesting for you in terms of the readings. Um, cool, okay. Who would like to go next? Oh, I see everyone's in, okay, cool. Hi. Can you hear me, right? I think you can. Yes, yeah. Maria. Hi. Um, so I'm Maria Jesus. I don't know why I pronounce it the English way, Maria Jesus. And uh, I'm from Peru. I I'm in the, I'm a certificate student at the Arts and Curatorial Practice Program. And uh, I think I have two entry points for this, for my interest in this uh, seminar specifically. The first one has to do with my interest in communities, specifically artistic communities and how they are, uh, let's say, entangled or intertwined into a city or, or other communities and that initially sparked an interest in me because of uh, really socioeconomical um, um, conditions of for for I'm, I'm a composer and I'm a musician and so uh, arts in, in general in Peru but specifically music I would say and, and performing arts are very undervalued and very underpaid so that there was like this first motivation to, to build communities, to kind of um, gather collective action and collective, um, I don't know, ways of expressing ourselves. So that was a entry point that has been developed to actually what you have been calling living infrastructures to the ways in which we can organize and what we can do to sustain ourselves and sustain our environment, because this, has been turned out to be a very complex situation, not just about like surviving as artists, but also like surviving with the environment in which we are involved in. So that's something I've been kind of reflecting on and something that I want to bring on this uh, many groups of people which I'm working with around this question of, of uh, all this, this uh, um, I don't want to say task, but I don't have right word right now, so I'll use task, task of sustaining ourselves. <laughs> and the other entry point, I think, it has to do with narratives of cultural memory and deterioration of that memory, which is something that is very prevalent in Peru, especially, I mean, Latin America in general, or maybe the world, but in Peru around this recent political events. And um, I'm really interested in how this all sustained through material means, but also through narrative means. And I really, I mean, I know that the concept of Anthropocene is very broad and maybe thrown out very casually out there, but here it's almost never used. So it's like a wide uh, contrast. I know I'm aware of, of, of the uh, general, to general of this general character of the term but i think when contextualized especially here it, it gains that there has there is a lot yet to be discussed uh and to be established and to what it exactly means uh for us in latin america or more specifically peru or even more specifically like the indian sector or the uh selva um it's not i don't know in the term in english but what we call silver here so yeah i mean there are many entry points actually but uh mainly through the uh, perspective of communities and the perspective of memory i'm very interested in this seminar great it's it's wonderful to meet you um and i think you know in terms of some of these issues that you're raising in week three we're going to be looking at the work of kasha paprocki um, she's a geographer who's written on what she calls anticipatory ruination um, in, in rural coastal Bangladesh um, as international funding agencies and governments try to build what they call climate adaptation and climate resilience. Um, and this involves, again, this sort of anticipatory ruination of communities, of the infrastructures that sustain them. And then in her writing, she discusses some of the questions of memory and loss and like cultural heritage that 
that come up in, in that kind of um, preemptive declaration of certain areas is already doomed and then the dismantling of their means to sustain, sustain themselves in the first place. Um, this is really powerful work uh, that I think that you'll, you'll like a lot. And, I, and again, I think, yeah, those questions of how do you, how do you hold on to um, uh, culture, place, meaning, uh, you know, attachments in a time when, you know, there are massive dislocations to um, the ability to survive in a place is, is, is huge. I, this is something also in um, Southern Louisiana, some, some friends of mine and some uh, much wider set of people are working on um, under the idea that, you know, even though that area is now being hit seemingly yearly over and over by hurricanes with not enough time to rebuild or anything like that, um, they want to stay and they want to, um, at the same time, not just stay and build the infrastructure for a sort of autonomous survival in that region, but also to have a sort of um, uh, cultural revival and even renaissance and reclamation of the indigenous um, uh, history and life way and language and, and all of that, of that, of that region. So it's very interesting uh, new project um, that they're working on there, even, you know, amidst other narratives that say that area is totally doomed and done. So it's an interesting combination of things. Yeah, maybe I just wanted to add to that, that specifically, yeah, that question of memory also entangles that other question of indigenous knowledges and practices. And uh, here it also has a different connotation when applying this big word indigenous to very many um, different knowledges and practices from, I mean, almost every region here in Peru. So as well as any country, I would say. Um, but yeah, I I just wanted to point out that for me, it would be kind of a challenge to uh, make this charting, I think that's the word, of, of whatever we are talking about and placing it in luckily, but locally. But um, yeah, I mean, I still find it very useful, whatever tools we are. Cool. Awesome. Okay. We have a couple more folks who haven't um, introduced themselves. And so let's go ahead and, and do those. And I'll try to keep my own comments brief. And then, then we can move into the um, little bit of introduction to the class. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Ana. I'm, I'm from and currently based in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, I am I am a certificate student at the art and practice program here at the New Center, and I have a background in painting and in many practices on visual arts. I got an MFA in interdisciplinary poetics in visual arts, and I actually been for the past like ten years working with artistic practices applied to apply to local communities on how to make sense of the ecological disaster we are now facing, but you know, we have data saying that for a long time. So how to make sense of that on people's life, how to make sense of university data on people's lives and how they, those things can communicate. I've been working with that for a long, for a lot of time. And meanwhile, when I was starting my MFA and this is like five years ago, something like that, I started making a, it is an artistical and theoretical uh, research that I called an urban poetic pollination. That is, um, it, it is experimental practices that work with scientific data and artistical experimental practices to give sense to those, those changes in life. And well, I am right now, I, I am an artist, but I am, I am right now making um, a master's in philosophy and I'm studying Donna Hathaway's SF proposal and all of her discussions around the Cthulhu scene and all of that and how how to propose an ethics of situated knowledges and things like that and right 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 now I'm thinking that a lot in relation to our to our eating habits and how the cities shape landscapes in the cities and in the 
rural areas, I'm not sure that's how to say, and how we, we shape landscapes like in cities. And we here, at least in Brazil, we are actually deforestating wildlife to, to have like uh, soy plantations and corn plantations are all around and, and all of those problems. And how this is all done under the name of a production of food, but actually the people that are in prison in, in the cities are in these past two years since the, the COVID, this, those people have increasingly been more hungry. We have a hunger rate uh, rising every day. And so how do all of those things connect and how we can <laughs> like make a better life inside those all of those infrastructures and i really see the the imagination and the experimentation from the idea of ex experimentation that goes from arts and science as something very important for us to you know imagine these other possibilities with your with ordinary people having a say in all of that so i think that's a, a summary of it Awesome. It, yeah, it's great. Great to meet you. It sounds all incredibly interesting. And um, yeah, I think that it's the, the question of food and how how people can and will eat in the coming decades has become obviously such a big question in the in the world right now, and a politicized one with the, you know, eat the bugs kind of narrative right now uh, that is being circulated mimetically so much. And there's the George Monbiot kind of like big interview that everyone is a little bit upset about right now about giving up farming and eating you know um soy grown in a factory in a city something like this it's these are these are big questions and it's a, and we live in such an interesting time because they're not just um practical questions they are super super charged politically and mimetically and all of that uh and so that's something i'd like to look at too not just how do, how do these how are these solutions being designed you know as just technical you know infrastructures but also what are what is the discourse and the 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 the, the, the fight even being being waged around some of these these questions of even food right um yeah that's so that's super super interesting um and i agree and experimentation and imagination these are these are kind of the key these are the key to hold open i think in a time when they're being closed down um awesome okay who else oh future foods i'm so into that question actually um i will just say this i i went to recently a um well, a couple of years ago now in New York, it was a NASA, um, like they were on tour. It was NASA on tour. And they were trying to get people excited about NASA again and about space exploration again, because there was this sense that like SpaceX is interesting and cool, but NASA is lame and old, you know? And so they were on tour doing these sort of like demos of like um, what NASA does, what it's like to be on, you know, a space shuttle and what a big part of their, their effort and their like sort of like sh their shtick was like food. How are we going to eat? How do we eat in space? You know, and how do we grow like lettuces in space and things like that? And that and that was one of the main areas where people in the audience were actually excited because I think um, obviously we're always interested in that question: how do you, how would you eat in space? How do you eat in a contained environment? But also, I think now these have become such questions for our reality here too. People are asking, you know, how will you eat in um, radically changed environments or radically? Um, you know, artificially um, scarce environments and, and so forth. Yeah, so that's a really interesting topic. Um, all right, who would like to go next? Hey, I can go next. And my name is Rachel. So I'm um, in the post-planetary, I'm a certificate student in post-planetary and I'm currently studying architecture based in Los Angeles. And uh, recently I've been really interested in looking at extreme edge conditions and understanding the effects that those have on uh, populations, all sorts of populations that live in the habitats kind of in between. And have been working a bit on using uh, computation. So uh, becoming familiar with algorithms and using them to create surface variation as a way of sort of mediating the populations that exist there. Super interesting. Um, <laughs> Edge conditions, I would love to hear more about that uh, at some point or now or whenever, um, what, what kind of edge conditions you're looking at. Um, because that's something that we'll talk about um, actually in just a minute to some extent in this idea of the back loop um, and uh, what can happen in a time of 
extreme, you know, sort of environmental disruption, what becomes possible in an ecosystem or in a human ecosystem. Um, so a lot of people now increasingly kind of, a lot of future futurists are kind of talking about, you know, the kinds of populations and communities that will do well in the, 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 the disruptions coming. Sorry, we're having a huge storm. It's really loud thunder. Uh, um, will be those ones that are like, uh, they're good at edge conditions, that they're pioneer species, they're good at thriving in, in disrupted landscapes and so forth. Um, that's a that's a big trope you see in a lot of like future future theorists um, thinking, and I I personally find that very interesting too. Are there any particular edge edge systems or edge landscapes that you look at in your work? This I'm sort of at the beginning of this, so I've um, been looking at really anything. So anything from like a cliff edge condition that meets a body of water, or to um, populations that have been like annihilated by uh, desalination and, and other man-made conditions. But it could be, um, I'm, inter I'm totally interested in uh, organisms that are extreme survivors, but also ways that um, surface variation can invite other populations back into those areas. Awesome, super, super interesting. That's something I, I think it'd be great to talk about more as, as we go in the in the coming weeks. Um, is has anybody have I missed anyone? No, there's a couple other folks maybe who haven't introduced themselves still. Would you guys like to go? Yeah. Alexander, I think you have a yeah, it was a bit of a do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was an audit for, I don't know, not sure why, but now I'm a panelist, I'm uh, okay. I'm, uh, my name is Alexandra, I'm uh, living in Stockholm, I'm a certificate student in post-planetary design. I'm uh, trained as a landscape architect at base, but with a turn at some point in socially engaged design. Uh, I'm slowly moving towards more experienced design with the urban space, aiming to bring the ideas that to circulate in the new center and around and translate them uh, for a more general public uh, through it yeah, into experiences that hopefully stir a bit of um, discussion. So that's in a nutshell. Hmm? Awesome. This sounds incredibly interesting to me, too. Um, I, I, I wanted to just say a little something about I, you guys are having a lot of comments in the, the chat too. Um, I don't know if, do you guys, actually, this is a question, not a comment. Do you use the Discord for this class? Is that something you all will use or, or want to use? Yep. You like yeah, the Discord? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Because then I'm, I, you can also, I'll, I'll use that too. I like Discord. So I'm, I'm happy to kind of chime in there if there's other, you know, references that you want or anything. Uh, I'll, I'll monitor that. Cool. Okay, who else? Um, are we missing someone? Did uh, we get everyone? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Swati, and uh, I'm based in Calcutta, India. Uh, I'm a final year PhD student at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and my background is basically in literary studies. So what I've done in my PhD research is uh, take up the concept of desire or desiring production uh, from uh, the Lucian Guattari and applied it to the works of Salman Rushdie. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I'm keen to, uh, I have no expertise in urban geography or design and infrastructure, but uh, what I'm keen to explore is how I can uh, link literary studies with the concept of the Anthropocene, or maybe uh, uh, focus on designing production as social production, but something which translates into or uh, links up with the concept of the Anthropocene. And uh, uh, I'm enrolled in uh, critical philosophy at the new school. So that's, uh, that's basically it. Thanks. Awesome. It's great to meet you. There is so much um, of an element of desire infused in any narrative around the Anthropocene in a, in a crazy way. And I think that's uh, sometimes unacknowledged. <laughs> um, so that's a really, really good. Do we have a couple more folks, the, the ones without the, the video on? Mm, I'm not sure. Um, otherwise I can go, I guess. I am Alfredo from Mexico. I'm an applied mathematician and an artist, and I'm also a student of the critical philosophy program here. 
Um, I'm interested in topics such as um, eco-socialism, uh, social epistemology, foreign cognition, and artificial intelligence. And throughout this, um, I'm currently doing my artistic research work in um, as a sort of dialogue between two concepts, the concept of the Greek concept of metis or cunning intelligence, practical intelligence, and the Celtal concept of Lekilkuk's Lehal, um, which is more of a well living or living well or a, a, an open aspiration to live uh, fully, to live well. And um, so this mostly comes down to to, to to a proposal in two big areas, which is social metabolism and or uh, reorienting, reformatting of social metabolism and also an ethics of care. Yeah. And awesome. I uh, thank you so much. It's great to meet you and thank you for your moderating help as well. Um, I think that the the topics of metis and uh, the, like the good life or living well are, are are super important because I in some ways one of the things I think we see the Anthropocene or that's again just the shorthand for this this sort of epochal moment of thawing that we're seeing around us. Um, I think we're seeing a thawing of you know the dominant ideas of what the good life is and what the the practices are for making it real, right? And I think so for so many people these are now the questions being asked. What is a life worth living? How do we make it real? You know, and, and in some ways, to me, that has to be the, the the opening questions of making a better future right now, because obviously we're not on that pathway. <laughs> it seems pretty obvious to me, at least. Um, amazing. So it's wonderful to meet you all. Uh, I'm I'm super excited to, to get a chance to talk with you for the next seven weeks. This is great. Um, you are all from such really interesting backgrounds. Um, and so let's, yeah. Let's have an attitude of talk at any time, you know, like, you know, raise your hand or, or just interrupt and say something at any moment, because I think that's the best kind of seminar. You know, it's always a bit weird online, but I think we can, sadly, we're all so used to it now. I think we can totally do it. So just, yeah, please, let's just feel free to talk um, openly and freely and, and learn from each other and see if we can actually maybe get somewhere interesting in our thinking too here. Um, let me just... You know, we have about an hour left in our in our allotted time. Let me just say a few things now um, to set up the sort of broad themes of what we'll look at in the coming weeks. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I have a little PowerPoint. Where is it? PowerPoint. Um, there you go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Now you, now you do. Cool. And, and is it full screen? No, it's not yet. Let me make you full screen. Now it's full screen. Yep. Cool. Um, I, I, I threw together just a few slides to kind of, for a couple of reasons. One, to just kind of guide the, the, the overview of the big Anthropocene themes that we're gonna look at. Um, but also because I'd like you to today and then in the coming weeks, think critically about even the imaginary and the images that we associate with the Anthropocene and that the Anthropocene and climate change and some of the, the, the present um, conflicts are um, framed through. So, so I want us to look at these images, not just as you know, um, you know, impartial representations of what's happening, but particular aesthetics and particular imaginaries of what's happening. Um, you know, and I, cause a lot of you are in, in the arts as well too. And I think uh, we can, you know, be reflexive about some of these things. So think of the PowerPoint images that, you know, I'll kind of walk through that way um, as much as just simple representations of our topics, right? Um, oops, sorry about that. I'm just totally awful with Zoom. Okay, there we go. Um, so so let's just start. I wanna just set up the Anthropocene in a very basic way to, to begin because that is sort of the broad concept under which, you know, the rest of the class is, is structured. Um, the Anthropocene is a word that you all, like you have said, are just hearing everywhere and have heard everywhere now for a decade, really. Um, it was a word originally sort of um, coined by Paul Crudson, atmospheric science scientist who died recently. Um, 
who uh, you know was very famous for winning the Nobel Peace Prize for um, figuring out um, how to solve the, the the hole in the ozone layer. Um, he proposed the Anthropocene as the new geological epoch that we're living in now. Um, he said, "Listen, we have been in the Holocene for the last eleven thousand or so years. The Holocene." Um, is the, you know, in your typical geology class that you might've had in high school, possibly, is what we were always told that we were living in. It's the past 11,000 or so years of relatively more or less stable climates on earth of a particular distribution of the earth's land and water and coastlines, right? Um, with, you know, ice at both poles, ice caps at both poles and so on and so forth. Um, and Paul Creason said, listen, um, I mean, I think it's very clear that we have entered into a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. Um, and the Anthropocene was designed as a term to refer to the fact that humans, the, hu the human impact on earth systems has now become more powerful and influential than natural processes like volcanoes or sedimentation or, or what have you. That humans have become the dominant um, geological agents, as he said at that time. Um, uh, upon the Earth's surface and its um, systems in general, right? So that was in 2000 when that word was first used, um, at least by Paul Crutzen. And then it kind of, in the, in the subsequent decade, quickly rose to prominence. It was on the cover of most magazines in like the 2010, 2011, 2012 years as the sort of like new word, the new buzzword. It was the, as, as, um, we had said a minute ago, it was the big buzzword in the arts, in the theory world. Every book had Anthropocene in the title. Every exhibition, at the museums, the galleries had Anthropocene in the write-up, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and so, but it has different meanings even within the sciences where it originated. And then it came to have different meanings in the cultural spheres where it was quickly taken up too. Um, the way I think about it is that there are sort of these two definitions within geology and the earth system sciences. So for geologists, what you hear about a lot is this way of thinking about the Anthropocene as um, a matter of how do we figure out when it began? You know, where do we find these, these um, imprints of humanity in the earth's strata? And how do we mark that boundary point where it started, where we really began this new epoch? You know, and that's, the, that's these are complex questions for um, stratigraphers and for geologists because they have to find, you know, the golden spike, they have to prove, you know, that there are these long lasting traces and that, that we can actually detect according to very specific criteria where it began. Um, and that's, that's kind of the definition I think that you hear about a lot, especially in the arts and in the theory kind of worlds. Um, but I have per personally been really, um, I, I, I found that the way of talking about the Anthropocene that's used in the earth system sciences to be very valuable and it's and it's a bit different. For earth system scientists, they often talk about the Anthropocene as the earth and earth systems shifting into a new operating state. So their, their interest is kind of less focused on that past question of when did it begin, right? And more on what is happening now? What are these transformations um, that we're seeing in earth systems and earth climates now? And where are we heading? So this is a, a, a graphic that was created by um, Owen Gaffney and Will Steffen, um, who work in the earth system sciences, and they do a lot of work to come up with visual representations for the Anthropocene. And here what they're showing us is this, um, this little earth there you see, right? Um, which historically for the last 100,000 years has really oscillated back and forth between a glacial or an interglacial kind of state. Um, and then more recently, in that red circle there for the last 11,000 or so years, stayed in that sort of interglacial Holocene state of stable climates in which, you know, the majority of what we call modern human, human civilizations developed. Um, agriculture, as we know it, developed was developed then, um, and so on. But what they're showing us here, and this is how they think about the Anthropocene, is that really, in the last several decades, Earth has sort of started shifting out of that, that red Holocene zone and that um, 100,000 year cycle on this new sort of unknown trajectory, what they call the Anthropocene trajectory. And what I find very powerful in this image is that um, that trajectory is toward a sort of question mark, right? It's heading toward an unknown operating state, a new state that is not one that we've historically experienced as human beings. 
um, and what they, you know, uh, postulate is likely a hot house earth state, um, which is not a desirable state for, for human life. Um, but if we think about, if we kind of step back and think about the Anthropocene as being not only an environmental um, uh, problem and situation and epoch, but also one of social transformation, then that question mark also to me is a powerful one, right? Because we don't know where we're going right now, but it's clear we're on, we've opened up new pathways and, and, and they, other pathways also remain to be opened. And so the future as a question mark, I think really defines our time maybe more than it, than it ever has. Um, you know, I mean, I grew up in the nineties and it, and it really, there really was a feeling at that time, like a lot would not change. It's like, it's like, would anything ever change? But now the real like norm is that everything is changing all the time at every moment. And we're in this era of a real question mark. So for, for, for that reason, um, amongst others, I think this is an interesting graphic that they've created here. Um, and then there's a little, little quote there, Jan Zelashevich, who is one of the geologists who's been really big at, um, you know, pursuing and promoting this idea of the Anthropocene. Um, he's a very nice, very nice man um, at the University of Leicester in the UK. And, and he, he said, the earth seems to be less than one planet, but rather a number of different earths that have succeeded each other in time, each with very different chemical, physical, and biological states. And so what we are seeing, according to scientists um, who you know, work on this idea of the Anthropocene is that we are shifting into a new earth right now. So then what becomes really powerful for us to think about, I think, is what does it mean to be human in that context, to be self-aware of shifting into a new earth operating state? How do we respond to that? How do we respond to the forces that are creating that shift, right? Which would not be happening without, you know, industrial capitalism whatsoever. Um, what does it mean to think, to live, to build, to, to fight in that context, right? These are the, these are big questions that Anthropocene raises for us. Um, and one, one thing that I will just note at the beginning that I think is super interesting is that Jan Zelashevitz, um, this, who really is at the forefront and is always interviewed on the Anthropocene, he, um, at the outset, he said, listen, I want the Anthropocene to be a political event. He said, I want it to be a political event and it should be a political event. Um, and I think for a lot of the scientists who were, um, you know, pivotal in crafting this idea from the outset, they thought that Anthropocene could and should be this like earth shattering, massive transformation launching idea. And, and what, I, what I want us to keep in mind, um, you know, in the seminar is, has it been that at all? Could it still be that at all? Um, you know, I mentioned in the, a little bit ago that I, when this, this word started to be used, um, I, I, I really found it to be powerful. And I, and I thought, like these scientists, yeah, this could be, this could be like, I mean, to me, the Anthropocene equaled revolution. That was what was obvious to me at the time, at least I thought, how could you have a more all encompassing word for the sort of catastrophes of capitalism on earth than the Anthropocene? Because it, 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 it doesn't just talk about economy. It doesn't just talk about the environment. It doesn't just talk about the social. It talks about the sort of the wreckage that, that has been produced in all those realms and, and the way the earth has been reshaped under industrial capitalism um, that is so far reaching and so um, boundary crossing that we can't help but see it and think that everything has to change. I mean, I, I think that there's something about that that's very powerful and it affects, um, you know, every, 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 you know, corner uh, of life. And there is something of the potential of, of the power of the, the possible in that, right? I think there's something very, very, um, you know, um, pregnant in that, but, you know, I think about Badu's idea of the event a lot too with the Anthropocene, right? Cause there are books written about the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene event, uh, the event of the Anthropocene is the title of um, Christophe Bonnoy's book. Right. And, you know, and for Badu, an event is not something that is um, necessarily going to be right. It's not something that is inherently there. It, it depends on the subjects who have fidelity to it. Right. And it depends on the people who um, respond to it and change with it and in for it and in, in reaction to it. Right. 
Um, and it's never a done deal, right? So has the Anthropocene been an event? I don't, I don't know. Or if it has been an event, maybe it's been an event um, not in the way that one might have hoped. Maybe it's been an event for um, very, very uh, dark forces. That's possible too. So it's just sort of a question I wanna kind of put out there and something to think about as we go forward. Um, in, in my own work, I have tried to put a little bit more um, specificity on the way that uh, I, I read the Anthropocene as this time of, you know, not just climate change and not just environmental devastation, but also really um, profound social dislocation. Um, and so I've worked with this concept of the adaptive cycle um, that, that may be useful to, to a lot of you. Um, it comes from ecology, from resilience ecology. Um, and it's a, it's a very basic sort of heuristic represented in this image you see here for understanding the sort of lifetime of systems. So it, this, this is um, what you see here. It's sort of a figure eight on its side. This is the diagram of the adaptive cycle. It comes from the work of C.S. Halling, who is the ecologist who um, really uh, originated the concept of resiliency in the first place. And so he um, developed resilience as a practice and an understanding of ecosystems uh in the 1970s so he was really working against sort of a steady state equilibrium style um, ecosystem management and what he said was that you know we look at ecosystems and we see well actually i mean any system he according to resilience ecologists everything in the system in the world is a system a city is a system our lives are systems a pond is a system right so they see everything in terms of systems and I, I will just say as a side note, I don't think we should wholesale accept that view of the world, right? Because there are, there are many um, resonances and you know, affinities between cybernetics um, and ecology, and they are not just natural depictions of the world, right? But I think we can, we can use this as a, a lens, maybe just one lens through which to see the present moment of the Anthropocene. So he said, everything in the world is a system and systems, all go through sort of two phases of life, a front loop and a back loop. So this diagram here, the adaptive cycle, depicts the front loop and the back loop. They're the little bit of the ribbon that's sort of in the front, in the foreground there, that has the arrow from exploitation to conservation is the front loop. And then the, the part of the ribbon that's in the background that's a little bit darker from release to reorganization, that's the back loop. Um, and so what Halling and then subsequently uh, resilience ecologists in general said is that, listen, um, historically, ecology thought that ecosystems would just pass from that, that front loop through that front loop phase and stay there forever. This is that sort of equilibrium thinking where you have this sort of exploitation phase in the front loop of um, pioneer species. That, you know, I'm thinking again of edge ecosystems, like pioneer species that come in to disturb landscapes or less um, utilized landscapes and immediately like harness the resources and, and take up space and create new connections over, over a, a, a quick, relatively quick period of time, you shift into a sort of stable or conservation state, steady state, where let's think of a forest, you know, you initially have very small um, you know, seedlings and so forth that kind of colonize a, uh, maybe let's say a disturbed space and quickly over time grow into what becomes a mature forest, right? Where you have um, the feedbacks of carbon and water and, and sunlight and so forth sort of locked in particular um, relationships. You have particular species that dominate uh, taller trees that, you know, block a certain amount of light from the, the uh, forest floor, forest, forest floor um, and so forth. You know, this is a mature forest that is kind of a, a standard picture of what a, um, a steady state ecosystem might have looked like. And for, for most of its history, uh, ecology was kind of concerned with maintaining ecosystems in that steady state where sort of everything was in its place more or less, right? But hauling and then resilience ecology more broadly uh, they intervene to say, well, actually systems go through another um, moment, which is the back loop. So rather than just trying to um, preserve them in that steady state forever, you have to recognize that they often also pass through a period of disorganization, collapse, fragmentation, and release. That's the back loop. A classic example in ecology is the forest fire. A forest fire comes in, obliterates that landscape, incinerates um, a lot of the mature tree stock, 
um, animals have to take refuge elsewhere or are killed, so on and so forth. All those feedbacks that made up that system get disrupted. That's the release sort of period of a back loop. That's, that's their term, release, right? Um, and but one of the very interesting uh, interventions that, that Halling and the resilience ecologists make is that they say a back loop is not only a time of um, destruction and collapse, right? It's also a time of reorganization, potential for um, previously unknown forms of experimentation and um, new pathways, right? So because those existing relationships that dominated in the front loop have been disturbed, there is now space open for new experiments, new relations, new um, uh, projects, let's say, any, any, or, or new, um, you know, in the, in the case of an ecosystem, you might have new predator prey relations. You might have um, new species moving in that weren't able to thrive, let's say um, new plant species, because now more sunlight reaches the ground than it did with the uh, mature tree cover. Or you might have animals making homes in like, um, you know, burned out tree stumps, things like that. You have new space open for new combinations and the forces that dominated in the front loop no longer dominate, right? So, so this to me is a really interesting heuristic or, or lens through which to see the Anthropocene. Um, and that's what I've tried to kind of flesh out in some of my, my writing um, in, in the Anthropocene back loop book, for example, um, if you wanna look at that. It's, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that we can kind of think about the Anthropocene as having a front loop and a back loop. Um, so the front loop would be this period that we often hear about in most accounts of the Anthropocene, right? This is more of a historical period though now, in some ways. Um, we think about that front loop exploitation period, all those extremely violent, extremely, um, you know, uh, colonizing uh, forces that really brought the whole world into the capitalist, global capitalist um, embrace, right, over the last several centuries. So these, these things, these forces of colonization, of slavery, of uh, resource extraction, the industrialization of production, you know, the, 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 the proletarianization of human beings worldwide, bringing them into, uh, making them into wage workers, making people into the working class over time, um, the separation of people from lands, uh, from practices and know-how, uh, you know, and so forth, you know, of course, the, the beginning of use of fossil fuels and so on. All those, I think we can kind of, you know, of course, very roughly speaking, put in that front loop exploitation phase. Um, and by the way, I'm not suggesting like a periodization here with this, like this started in 1750 and it ended in 1950. I'm not, I'm not trying to make any claim like that. It's more just, again, a heuristic to kind of periodize roughly, not um, you know, according to a timeline, but just more for, for our own thought in order to understand the present and why we're in such a, a unique time. Um, so then I think if we, if we look at sort of this mid 20th century moment, as the sort of stability state, so-called stability state of the Anthropocene front loop, we might think of things like, um, you know, in a, you know, in the American context, the New Deal, the rise of modern infrastructure, and you know, um, globalization of the sort of um, liberal capitalist one world world, to use John Law's term, the one world world, sort of homogenous spread of um, capitalist economy, work, culture, and so forth. Um, it's very much shaped by this idea that there is a, a divide between the human and the non-human, human and nature. Um, this, you know, idea of the human as they're um, at the center, there to order the rest of and use the rest of the world as a commodity, as an object, so on and so forth. And of course, backed by stable climates, right? The sort of um, uh, particular coastlines, particular um, climactic patterns, so on and so forth, being the sort of backdrop, but always there to that front loop period. Um, and I think a lot of times when we read, you know, critical work on the Anthropocene, it describes the Anthropocene and Western civilization in those kinds of terms, right? We hear words like what I was just saying, and we, we, we hear it characterized in, in ways similar to what I was just saying. However, I think we've entered into a new phase, the back loop of the Anthropocene, where uh, that is defined by the fragmenting and the coming undone of those codes, of those forms, of those ontologies, of those ways of doing things, um, and of those climates, right? So the back loop is this moment of release where I think we can say we, we are roughly now 
um, a time marked by the actual sort of beginnings of climate change rather than, you know, when we were younger, it was like just like only these projections from scientists and charts and stuff. Now we're actually seeing, you know, rising seas. We're actually seeing an uh, increased number of natural disasters, hurricanes, um, so on. Um, but also this moment of the sort of fragmentation of modern codes, um, modern thinking, even modern politics. You know, and this is something we'll talk about later, but very much um, this, this was a time, I think the front loop of the Anthropocene can be understood as a time of, you know, philosophy and politics as the attempt to instantiate a one, right? Um, a, a first principle for being an action that would then be applied to life and to the world. Um, and instead we're entering this, this, this fracturing moment, um, post-truth moment, plurivisal moment. So, so this is sort of the Anthropocene uh, back loop idea that I, I, I think is a little bit interesting because it helps us see that we're at this moment of release and maybe potential, right? But that potential isn't necessarily inherently positive in any way, right? It's a time of reorganization, but it's a time of reorganization for um, a lot of actors and not just like positive ones. Um, oops, sorry about that. It's a time of reorganization for um, government, for planners, for the military, for business, for capital, as well as for ordinary people, hopefully, right? Um, so it's this time where um, things are opening, but we have to ask ourselves what to do in that context and where to go and like what kinds of openings um, we're seeing and who's capitalizing on them, right? Um, so to put a little bit more specificity to that, I want to, to think for a second about sort of this new trajectory that the earth is on uh, that we're and how we're seeing this sort of unfold around us. This is another diagram um, created also by um, Owen Gaffney and Will Steffen, those earth system scientists who um, had the, the, the question mark trajectory one earlier. And uh, this is them suggesting that, you know, uh, we are, the earth is heading out of that stable stability state and, and moving toward these sort of planetary thresholds where um, if, you know, if the existing course of things, the business as usual course of things continues, we'll be on a trajectory toward hot house earth. And there's really nothing, not, not a single thing that says we're not on that trajectory already. And there's nothing changing that. In fact, it's only more sort of fuel for the fire, I think being added right now. So that's where we're heading, it looks like. Um, and again, this new sort of new earth state that we are, we're entering in, um, you know, it takes on a lot of different forms. Um, and here's where I mentioned earlier, I'd like us to think about some of the visuals and the um, imaginaries and aesthetics, as well as the material realities of this new Anthropocene Earth state that we are heading into. So, I mean, one of the obvious things, you know, and that, that I've dealt with a whole lot in my own work is sea level rise, the melting of the ice at the poles, um, and how this is then playing out in cities coastally worldwide. This is a photo from Miami uh, from the sunny day flooding that we get there um, now, which is really uh, a lot more common. Uh, and so what's really interesting is that there are a lot of places where you say, you know, sea level rise is still a projection or prediction, but in Miami, it's already happening. It's water in the street that comes up um, through the street drains, as well as from the coasts, um, even when it's not raining. So you see it there, it's salt water, it's in your street and you know, it would be in my street, um, you know, in sometimes during um, particularly high tides. So we'll talk about that because Miami is an interesting case to see what it looks like when that, um, when we do have sea, sea level rise in, you know, modern technologically uh, uh, connected, super um, profit driven, super real estate driven cities like Miami. We're seeing it also in the, the form of these, these um, you know, increasingly frequent and strong hurricanes that are hitting um, the Gulf Coast here in the United States. And by the way, a lot of the examples that I'll use are from uh, the United States, and that's because that's where I live and that's where I do my research. Um, but I think we should together try to, you know, uh, as we go bring together examples from all the places that we're working from and, and thinking with too. So this is an example uh, from Hurricane Ida from last year, which hit the Louisiana Gulf Coast. And it was one of just a, a growing sequence of storms that have been battering the Gulf Coast down there. We're seeing this, this um, also increase in extreme rainfall events, precipitation events. So Ida was very 
um, it was interesting and devastating because it hit the Gulf Coast down there where you see the two, but then continued and traveled all the way up into the east, northeast and hit New York, where you then had um, just massive historic amounts of rainfall um, in the city that flooded and in some cases killed people in their basements while they were sleeping. Um, and so this was unprecedented flooding just from rain, which is something that we're also now seeing as part of this new earth state more frequently um, in places uh, that are not equipped to deal with so much rain in such a short amount of time. This is um, Hurricane Harvey uh, when it hit Houston back in 2017. And this is that we're seeing now um, what's becoming sort of like a iconic or defining or ubiquitous image of the Anthropocene uh, of flooded cities, flooded highways, and just ordinary people in their boats trying to help each other get out. That's become, you know, an every year image that we now see. Of course, we have the heat, the question of heat, which I think this year has been super problematized in the media quite a lot. Like um, you had in London a couple of days ago, we've had massive heat waves here in the United States with um, you know, record breaking temperatures and so on and so forth, uh, melting infrastructure, melting um, you know, public transportation uh, infrastructure, melting roadways, buckling roadways, causing deaths and so on. We might think also of then some of the questions of um, drought and drinking water shortages that we're seeing. And again, this is in the uh, American West. We're having historic low levels on um, drinking water uh, reservoirs. Uh, this is then leading to um, governmental attempts to deal with this, rationing and so on. And this is one area that raises, I think, huge questions for the future of habit habitability of that area. You know, you can elevate buildings, but what do you do without water? These are big, big questions. Each of these raises big questions, and, and that's what we'll talk about in coming weeks. Um, thinking about the desert, uh, as uh, Nima had put it, this is you know kind of a, a, an image that is often very an, icon an iconic type of image of the Anthropocene of these sort of homogenous landscapes, right? Of these endlessly paved surfaces, suburbs with houses that all look the same, you know, um, uh, this kind of homogenous sort of life too. That has been instantiated uh, increasingly throughout the world of, you know, sort of, you know, to, to be kind of like banal about it, like this sort of like McDonald's, like Hollywood life, um, but also the actual des desertification of um, ecosystems. We have the Amazon now becoming um, a savanna, and this is a, a potentially tipping over to be a carbon emitter. Clear cutting of forests. This is an issue we'll talk about because here it, later in the in the seminar here in Atlanta where I am right now, there's a big um, struggle, land defense struggle around um, the city and um, the Atlanta police attempts to um, clear cut the the largest forest in the city, which can be an important carbon sink and source of um, urban heat mitigation uh, to build a police training facility, a mock city for counterinsurgency, and a uh, Hollywood soundstage uh, set of studios. So it's a big struggle around that. And this, I think, is a very interesting Anthropocene struggle that raises a lot of uh, issues uh, that are worth thinking about. So, so the Anthropocene, you know, is the, the sort of common way of, um, the, the, one of the, the, the most sort of common and sort of overarching ways of thinking about it is that it is this build, the Anthropocene front loop is the progressive building of this landscape of capitalist urbanization, right? And then like this meme is just very, I think uh, I always use this in my classes, like very evocative of that. It's like, why don't you go outside? Well, look what they built. This is the, this is the environment that has been built that we, we are born into and that we now you know, live in, right? So, um, but I think also the Anthropocene, and this is super important, has to be understood as um, you know, affecting the social realms as well. And that the, 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 the desertification, but also the, the, the sort of degradation of the natural environmental world is flanked by what's happening in the subjective world that we're seeing right now. And here is this uh, a quote that I think is very apt to describe kind of where we are with the back loop in terms of the social side of things. Um, from the Invisible Committee's book now, I don't know if any of you have read that, but it's got some, some very relevant um, uh, interpretations of the present uh, for, for our purposes. It says, we're the contemporaries of a reversal of the process of civilization into a process of fragmentation. The more civilization aspires to a universal completion, the more it implodes at its foundation. The more this world aims for unification, the more it fragments. And I think, you know, 
especially since 2016, and again, I'm speaking from the American context, but I do think this pertains elsewhere as well. We have seen so much fragmentation and social um, uh, strife and social war and social conflict. Um, we no longer see, you know, there are these two, there's left and right. No, there's, there's a splintering into a thousand million versions of the alt-right, the alt-left, the far, you know, all this online, especially in, um, you know, in social media uh, as well, this sort of splintering of subjectivity of what the political means. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with the internet, of course, um, but not only, you know, I think that we have reached this moment where the, you know, the codes that, that supposedly grounded modern neoliberal society are really coming undone. So, you know, I think if we can think about Nietzsche here who wrote well, well, well before our time, but described it quite well. You know, he talked about the state of nihilism. What is nihilism? Nihilism is when um, the, 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 the values and the codes that, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the society believed in are no longer believable. They come undone. We no longer believe in them, but we haven't yet created other ones or ways of overcoming that way of creating value in the first place. So it's a strange moment to be in, right? It's a moment of coming undone, but it's not, it's not a moment where the, the, the values from before, the codes from before have been replaced. So it's, a, it's an in-between moment. And it's a very chaotic moment. Um, we might think of it as a, a destituent moment in some sense. Um, if, if any of you, I know some of you are more in the philosophy uh, theory realm. You know, if we think about Giorgio Agamben's idea of a, a destitution, a, a, destitu a destituent action for Giorgio Agamben, the Italian philosopher, is an action that um, sort of undoes the ground for government. It, it, it undoes that um, governmental apparatus, right? But it doesn't necessarily you know, if we think about it in, at least in a, in a negative sense, it doesn't necessarily uh, create another, right? Because that's the whole idea. We're not, it's not a, an action that aims to create another constituted power. It's an undoing action. So we're in a destituent moment, I think, um, that we see in a lot of areas. Um, I think we see, oh, <laughs> I forgot I had included this. This is a uh, this is just a, uh, a, a, a sort of meme and a, and a discourse that's circulating a lot online right now about this sort of live in the pot, eat the bugs um, narrative. I don't know how many of you are seeing this, but uh, it's very much this right wing response to a sort of green uh, liberal austerity discourse that's being uh, circulated more and more as, as a response to climate change. And I included this only because I think part of this fragmentation of the back loop of the Anthropocene that we're seeing is this online sort of social social war between sort of fabricated poles of, of so-called left and right um, around things like this that kind of change every day. But we're also seeing, you know, in this the, 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 the sense of a destituent moment, we're also seeing um, a sequence of uprisings, unlike many that we had seen for a long time. I mean, that we had been in an era of social pacification in the United States uh, at the very least, but also worldwide for a long time. But we have now had a, a sort of sequence of uprisings. And this is an image from the George Floyd rebellion in summer of 2020 here in, in America. Um, there was Hong Kong. We have had in France many big uprisings. I mean, just worldwide. I mean, if you look around right now, so many um, big insurrections or uprisings against rising food prices, inflation, gas prices, um, things like this. I think this is also part of this moment, right? These, these um, uprisings and riots and um, attempts to kind of break through the impasses of the existing constraints on life, but that haven't really gotten anywhere. I think they're part of this back loop moment. So coming back to this sort of heuristic one last time, I think that there's a, there's a utility in thinking about the Anthropocene through this lens because it helps us kind of locate our current moment in the Anthropocene as a very chaotic one um, that has both um, a lot of coming undone to it, but a lot of opening to it. And in which we have to think about how very diverse actors are trying to capitalize on that chaos or how they are trying to break out of this loop in some sense or maintain the loop, right? So I think about 
I think we can always kind of ask, you know, what is the orientation for a particular design or a particular infrastructure or practice? Are they trying to keep that infinity loop of sort of Western industrial capitalist society going by new means? Because I think we're seeing a massive governmental modulation right now to try to keep that loop going. Or if you look on the left-hand side there, there's that little exit, that little X you see there. I mean, that's always a possibility in a back loop. And that's very, very important. So our designs or infrastructures trying to take that exit pathway and get out of the loop and create some other way of living. I think that's always a good question we can we can ask. Um, and it's very hard. That's the part of the loop that's very under discussed within resilience ecology, but increasingly um, ecologists and sustainability practitioners are really talking about transformation. That's been something that's really changed within that field in the last several years. They're like, we're not just here to build resilience of what is, like of the existing systems. That's not what we should be doing. That's not even sustainable from a basic point of view, nor is it desirable. We should be working towards massive transformation. And so there have been a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of writing and a lot of practical interventions from even the realm of ecology um, to try to build out that X, that X right there, that exit pathway. Um, and I think that's actually pretty a, a cool development within that field. Um, one thing to note about a back loop that is also, I think, super interesting um, for us to think about with regards to the Anthropocene is that when ecologists talk about it, about a back loop, they emphasize that there is not one necessary direction that it's going to go in. There's not one necessary outcome. There are many possibilities, right? So you could have resilience. You could make the existing system resilient so that it's able to deal with the like, you know, the, 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 the destruction that it may be encountered or the difficulties or the disturbance that it encountered, but it can keep going. You know, no, no problem. We just remodulate some things. We keep things going. We build some seawalls. We keep Wall Street dry. No problem. Um, but there are other possibilities. Transformation, like I was just saying, is a, is a term that they use really often. And there can be forced transformation or there could be popular transformation. There are different you know, ways to think about that. Transformation isn't even inherently positive, right? There could be enforced transformation. Um, uh, Joel, Rain, Joel Wainwright and Jeff Mann, um, geographers, they, they have a book um, about climate leviathan, you know, and there is that possibility of a, a, a massive state-led top-down eco intervention that, that, you know, in the name of emergency could also be one outcome of or one version of transformation. Um, there are escapes, that's one possibility from back loops. Some, some elements, some life forms escape and create other loops or other forms of life while the loop itself continues. That's possible. Um, simply confusion and chaos is also a possibility, right? So, so that's a possibility where instead of sort of like naively saying, ah, you know, it's great. The old system's breaking down. This is great. Let's make the new one will come and da, da, da. Um, this is just confusion and chaos that builds and grows and spreads. It's a, maybe a different kind of desert. <laughs> it's like a, um, a more um, multifaceted desert. There's also the possibility of sort of cross scale cascades between different systems, right? Because systems are always connected, especially they've been built to be connected in the world now. So there's a possibility of cascades between systems. A disaster here affects a disaster here or a transformation here affects um, a stable system here, what was a stable system here. There's always the possibility for surprise, for novelty, for unexpected synergies. And there's, again, there's the possibility that nothing new is created at all. So there are, there are dark possibilities in a back loop as much as there are potentially liberatory possibilities. Um, what resilience ecologists emphasize, though, above all else, is that experimentation is the key. So in a back loop, the thing to do is not continue doing what you've just always been doing as if nothing's changed, right? The, the key is to recognize that, um, you know, you need to try new things, experiment wildly and radically and be okay with that failing and try something new uh, until you find uh, a form that works or continuously, right? Experimentation is the key. Um, thinking with new sets of people, thinking with new sets of environments, trying new tools, trying new cross-pollinations. These are the key for a back loop because that is the space that's been opened and that is what 
uh, thrives in a back loop, that, that kind of practice, that kind of ethical orientation and that kind of material practice is what can thrive in a back loop that maybe in a way that maybe was not possible in a, a more stable front loop environment. Okay, so this is sort of a um, methodological note that I wanted to make for us. Um, everything I just said sort of laid out uh, the Anthropocene and the back loop and the things kind of happening in the world environmentally and socially as if they're sort of a done deal or a fact, as if they were unquestionable. Um, and I think that often is what is done in discussions of the Anthropocene. But instead, what I would like us to do in this, um, in this seminar, as we approach different projects, infrastructures, works, concepts, so forth, what I want us to do is to always think from a problematization-based approach. And what I mean by that uh, is, is very much indebted to Foucault um, and a, a, a strand of geography as well. So I've included this little excerpt here where Foucault, you know, the, the, the very important French uh, theorist, um, he defines the method that he really uses in his own work and that I think is very important for us now. Basically, a problematization approach is about understanding um, how particular responses come to be seen as given. Responses to a particular situation, how they come to be seen as uh, necessary, obvious, acceptable, or givens, right? So a problematization approach is concerned with understanding how particular events or particular situations are framed in particular ways by specific actors in particular contexts. So rather than say, climate change is an emergency requiring um, state intervention, we have to ask, how does that kind of framing get produced? Who is producing it through what narratives, through what imaginaries, um, you know, and material practices? Um, and, and how is climate change itself being portrayed in certain ways rather than others, right? How do solutions come to be seen as the only way forward? So we can ask ourselves that at every point when we're talking about the Anthropocene, when we're talking about uh, urban infrastructure, whatever the case may be. Um, because the point of a problematization approach is always to see how things could always be another way. We could always be thinking um, the Anthropocene in different ways. The problems that it poses to us could be understood differently. They will be understood probably differently for each of us even in this seminar, right? depending on where we are, what we prioritize, what we value, so on. Um, and those ways of framing the problem itself will then lead us to different responses, right? So we wanna keep that opening there rather than, you know, I think what we see a lot right now in, in critical theory and in politics is this attempt to tell everybody what the one way forward looks like. Um, you know, this is not to say that it's not a time when we need like, uh, new ideas like i think we need those more than ever we need we need ideas because obviously we we don't have them right but at the same time i think we have to always ask ourselves how uh, a particular solution is actually being which is posed as a, a, a an obvious natural necessary one is is just but one amongst many others that could be right now right so i always want us to take this kind of approach as we're looking at different responses to the anthropocene right um for, for a lot of uh, thinkers, writers, theorists, artists, you know, the Anthropocene has been interpreted as um, uh, an existential dislocation that asks us to look at our, our, our mortality, to come face to face with our finitude. Um, and that was one discourse that we've kind of seen. Um, this is an op-ed by Roy Scranton that was in the New York Times actually uh, about a decade ago when that, in that moment of the Anthropocene really being first talked about. It was very influential in a lot of ways. And he said, you know, the biggest problem climate change poses isn't, you know, planning for resource wars or putting up seawalls or, or turning off the air conditioning. It's that it's a philosophical problem that the Anthropocene poses. Um, it's understanding that this civilization is already dead. And then if we want to learn to live in the Anthropocene, we must first learn how to die. And that was his provocation. Um, you know, and it, I, I'm just leaving this here as sort of like a, 
a provocation to everybody else too, to think about, you know, what does this mean to you? How do you interpret that? What would it mean to, to learn to die as a, as a civilization, as a way of life? Um, or to understand that the, the one that we are in is already dead. What do you do if you're living in an already obsolete form? You know, what is, how do you respond to that is a big question, I think, for us. Um, I think there's also an, a, many other poetic sort of ways we might think about the Anthropocene. Um, for, for a lot of people, for a lot of thinkers, uh, the Anthropocene has rendered us earthbound in a way that we might not have been thinking about before as humans. Um, sometimes it makes me think of this Rilke uh, set of lines from the ninth elegy. He says, we the most ephemeral, once for each thing, only once, once and no more. And we too once, never again, but this once to have been the only once to have been an earthly thing seems irrevocable. In some sense, you know, for a lot of thinkers and writers and artists, considering the Anthropocene, considering the big questions um, of, you know, the habitability of life on earth, of the destruction of life on earth, of the destruction of the life ways and life forms on earth by uh, neoliberal uh, regimes, it brings up a lot of very big questions that are material. How do you live in a flooded zone? How do you live in a zone with no water? How do you live in 120 degree temperatures? You know, it, those are material questions, but it also brings up these deep existential and philosophical questions. What does it mean to live on earth? What does it mean to have an earth? You know, what does it mean to be um, of the earth, you know, in a, in a, in a um, positive sense? You know, these are, these are really big questions that don't have a single answer, but that, that are raised by the Anthropocene. Um, how much time do we have? What time is it? Let me look at my clock. Ah. I'm going to I'm going to stop here with the with this part of things. What I would like to say is that um, I think that so far what we have really seen in terms of dramatic responses to the Anthropocene have been in the realm of um, capital, finding massive new ways to um, extract value out of um, disasters and dislocations, right, of peoples and environments. Um, in design, in the, the, the real transvaluation of the values that undergird um, urban and landscape design, uh, and in the theory world, in this attempt to kind of posit these new um, ontologies of human non-human entanglement. But I do not think we've seen Anthropocene events. I do not think we've really seen, um, you know, massive uh, popular responses to it in a way that we could. Um, so what we're going to look at in the in the coming weeks are some of those um, types of responses in the realm of design and infrastructure, and we're going to really question them both materially, imaginally, philosophically, and so forth. Um, but I think what, you know what, I, what's important now is that ordinary people are able to um, come up with something better than what we have right now in in this moment. So to me, that's always the 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 ethical horizon of any of these kinds of investigations. It's both to understand what practices of government what spheres, to use uh, Peter Sloterdijk's term, what spheres for human existence are being built right now in these new environments, um, what new forms of control and um, subjectivity are being produced, but also how to pursue liberation, even in this context, especially in this context, right? Um, okay, so like I said, we can always have some time for discussion or questions at the end. So let me just maybe stop and see, does anyone have any questions or, or thoughts you'd like to discuss? Yeah, Jesus. Okay, I, I have um, a really good, uh, I don't know how to say information, but it's a, it's a really good information about the process here in Chile because we are writing now a new constitution. And the last year, uh, the all, all the group who, who is writing the new constitution form a group to investigate uh, what is the, the Anthropocene uh, place in the new constitution, in the new Chilean constitution. So it's, it's really amazing because it's the first time here in Chile who uh, the, political, the politicians uh, speak and discuss about the, the thing of the environmental crisis in, the, in all in this vector about the concept of Anthropocene. So it's amazing, but the the critics uh, about this because uh, a group of politicians of the right right uh, 
I don't know how to say right sector of Chile, uh, have this kind of, um, uh, I don't know how to say, have this kind of critical, critic about why uh, the left side of the politicians uh, speak in a concept that is so huge and so problematic like Anthropocene. Because no, the 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 population or the Chilean people don't know. Uh, they don't know what is Anthropocene, and because uh, and it's really amazing because it's a it's a lot of conflict and a lot, a lot of fight about uh, what is Anthropocene and what is speak about it in in um, but not in environmental crisis. So it's amazing. I, I think it's it's really it's, it's really on the on the way of the curse. So, yeah, that is that's super <laughs> super interesting. So it's actually being used in there, right? I mean, I think you know what what ordinary people we what we know about are um, the price of gas, of fuel, of fertilizer, of food. Like these are things we know about. the The fact that um, the roads are flooded. I mean, and 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 there are, these are the ways in which very powerful responses to the actual dislocations of the Anthropocene are going to be waged. You know, um, it's interesting. That's interesting to think. And so then, um, are they are they trying to like explain it in some way in the Constitution, or is that is that what's next over there? Uh, sorry, I can I can hear you because my internet is not so, so stable. So what? <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Uh, are they are they trying to do some kind of like public community facing campaigns to explain what the word means? Yeah, absolutely. Because we uh, we have this kind of uh, I don't know how to say. I think it's a guide on on forums uh, forum groups to discuss the all the topics about the new constitution. So we have a group to. Um, uh, environmental uh, politics and things like that. So I think in now uh, in one of these kind of meetings, uh, all the meeting, all of, of the meeting is was to to concrete what it is Anthropocene means. So it's amazing because in the same re reunion, um, they discuss about the rights of the rivers or the rights of the mountains and it's on the environmental uh, justice. And it's the first time here in Chile we discuss politically uh, at the, that term. So it's amazing, but all the things is, okay, we, we need to speak about the rights of the river or we need to speak about the environmental justice and what, which, in which kind the, the thing is crossing. So it's a lot of questions from the Chilean population, so for the politics and the and the theorists and the academic researchers, so I think here here is there is, is the discussion is really hit now. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that those can be discussions happening just like kind of like on the ground all over the place. I think that's an interesting moment because you also then have the possibility of defining like on your own terms, it, it, in by the people having the discussions, what words you want to use. Or like what approaches you want to take, what, you know, what are the things that are valued, right? Rather than, I think there's like a, there's a certain set of certain stock phrases that are used, you know, for all these things. Anthropocene, um, environmental justice, you know, rights, ec ecological rights and so on. But it also might be a, a time where people are saying, okay, these maybe don't actually describe what we need and we, or they don't make sense to us. So it may be time to have other words. I remember someone saying, you know, in all likelihood, you know, even climate change, because in America, you know, there's like a lot of like climate change is a hoax kind of stuff uh, on, on the right. So it'll probably be like different words get invented just to describe what's happening. You know, it, it doesn't matter what the word is. It's just the what's happening and, and other words that will be acceptable to, to other people might be used. Um, yeah. Um, Alexander, you have your hand raised. You'd like to go? Uh, yeah, first, uh, thank you for your presentation. And I find this diagram with loops is very interesting because it um, gets us to contradiction with how people understand uh, history and progress. Like, it seems like humanity is very obsessed with drawing lines 
because we uh, normally we see the progress as a uh, line as economical and technical growth as eternal growth and we see history the same way and also uh, the examples of floods and so on you showed to us uh, it shows that we also um, like our approach to mapping is also drawing lines again uh, and once uh, we draw this line we start to capital inside of these lines as rivers as roads infrastructure but nature is don't work like this it's don't work as lines it's always cycles um, and bioregions is really fuzzy thing uh, it's not about uh, some strict uh, borders and rules and also and we, we can say about cities uh, i remember the article by christopher for Alex who speaks that um, he argues that uh, also not a linear tree structure is more like semi structure because society also don't work in this way but it's tricky how uh, humanity is always represents in their minds uh, all structures like something tree structured or linear structure but uh, in reality it's it's not work like this so I, I like this uh, loop thing because it brings us to the idea that we need to rethink our um, paradigm we live in somehow. You know, what I think is so interesting about what you're saying is that this criticism that nature is not a straight line, that, you know, that being is in a straight line, right, is, is so dominant now in urban design uh, and in planning that this this whole discourse that like uh McHarg, you know Jane Jacobs like all those thinkers you know from the 60s about cities are actually complex systems entanglements whatever this is now the wisdom or the the dominant wisdom of you know a lot of urban planning that brings in any form of thinking around resilience or social ecological systems or what have you that modern planning was wrong right we need to incorporate the the, the mesh work, the entanglement, the lattice, right? Rather than the, the straight lines. So you need to build, if you're building breakwaters, they need to have crevices and nooks and stuff like to incorporate like habitat for animals rather than a, a harsh uh, concrete uh, wall, right? This is so much the dominant thinking now, even though it was, so in, in many ways, the dominant uh, approaches to design and planning and government have incorporated those critiques that were made of them in the sixties very much. Uh, and I, I find that to be really interesting because this is a new way of um, sort of, you know, thinking about what can and can't be done in a, in a city and in, 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 in planning. And so government has really incorporated its critiques, critics very well here. Did anybody else have any thoughts or questions they wanted to, to raise? Mm, can anybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I just, yeah, I, I find it very sort of uh, interesting or like intriguing, like how in this sort of presentation, like your, uh, I don't know, perspective or your like vantage, vantage point of like, or your approach to thinking about Anthropocene is like very different from, or not drastically, but like, like like the sort of very situated context that uh, like how I've been working or thinking about Anthropocene, think about capital, think about like you know capitalist thing. I, I and you were talking about events, and I I think a lot of um, you were talking about this very sort of visually uh, how to say um, this. Uh, I don't know how to do very legit events like flooding or like forest fire, but like what I've been always thinking about is like quasi events or like slow violence, the kind of violence that um, uh, it's like a slow draining. So we're talking about the impact of Anthropocene. So in, in certain, in a lot of contexts like chemical exposures, a lot of these impacts happens very extremely slowly, like a, like a delayed destruction. And, 
Um, yeah, see, I've also been thinking about this. Uh, um, so I think we were talking about this uh, human non human entanglement or human non human divide or etc. And I kind of goes it kind of reminds me of or it reminds me of this very old text that, that Reza wrote has written like in around 2011 or something it's like drafting that inhuman I think the essay and he was writing about like uh, how um, like when we we're using this uh, even this like human non-human divide is kind of proof been proven uh, not so efficient and not so sufficient or kind of pro problematic exactly because uh, it's sort of mutation in the capitalist apparatus. So, and, and kind of also, I'm sorry, it's a bit convoluted, also relates to uh, Povanelli, like Elizabeth Povanelli's um, theorization on geontology and ge geonto power, like how, um, so I think, put it in a very uh, simplified way. It's like, um, so when we're talking about say the, the, the ongoing settler colonialism, um, certain human together with the land they depend on, they dwell in kind of, kind of are being bracketed into uh, this category of non-life so it's like like a life and non-life divide and and maybe certain human are kind of being deemed or being seen uh, on human and treated inhumane so this, this is a very sort of mm, mm, mutatable of uh, it's just constantly sort of reconfiguring of, of um, I don't know whatever phrase we use a human non-human or human inhuman or human more than human um yeah just a series of very convoluted thoughts <laughs> um yeah no, not not convoluted at all i think they're incredibly interesting i mean i think you you hit on a really important phrase of a, a mutation within capital or, or transformation within capital yeah. um right now mm -hmm. yeah and i and i think that that's something that we're seeing right now and and one of the reasons why i i always want to emphasize that we think critically about these claims that we see that the Anthropocene, you know, means we have to get rid of the, the dominant human nature binaries, right? And, and embrace this entangled um, social ecological meshwork model um, as the right, you know, enlightened proper model, right? I think we need to be critical of those claims because I believe that we are already within a mutation in capital that is all about remaking the world as a social ecological meshwork, right? As a, as an eco-cybernetic meshwork. So capital, in other words, I think has already moved towards that, you know, and, 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 and government has already moved towards that entangled uh, eco-cybernetic model. Therefore, if we say that, that um, we're being counter hegemonic by calling for that kind of model, we are missing these transformations, right? That are already happening around us. And I think that that's a really important thing to, to not miss, you know, um, and we'll, I, we'll get into that more, but yeah. Um, so I see that we have like three minutes left. So I don't, I, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should stop it here. Um, I, I, I see that in the chat, you put there's a spreadsheet so everyone can sign up for the presentations on there, I guess. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I had I had a question about that, Stephanie. So I wanted to present um, the who is cosmotechnics as cosmo as cosmopolitics, yeah. but it's uh, suggested for the reading, and so I I didn't know if like we needed to fill all the readings first. Like we have a presentation for each of the I don't know mandatory or or more important readings, which are for for the next week first, and then have another extra presentation in this case about Hui, or I can present, uh, I make a presentation, excuse me, for cosmotechnics and cosmopolitics um, regardless. 
Yep. That's fine. You Good can to totally that. present that. Yeah. Yep. And there's no need to fill okay. every reading. Mm-hmm. I, I'd like you guys to just present the ones that you are interested in. And that's why the suggested readings are there. I almost had that one as the main reading anyway. So that's great. Um, yeah. Feel free to select your presentation from either the main readings or the suggested readings. It doesn't matter to me. And yeah, the, the Cosmotechnics uh, Yokue reading is totally on the table. Yeah. I think that's a really useful frame for us to, to look at. So definitely be great if someone wanted to present it. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, you guys, it looks like everybody yeah. wants oh, to present it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I have a, like a, a physical copy of the Spanish translation. So yeah, I'm kind of a fan. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. What book? What, what book, Anna? Uh, are you on cosmotechnics? I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to, to say that um, maybe I, I don't remember the name of uh, the moderator. I'm very sorry. What was your name? Uh, me, I'm Alfredo. <laughs> Alfredo. Okay, okay. Alfredo, uh, do you mind if I like copy a column for the text for and call it like yep. uh, okay. Uh, extra readings. I don't know. Any name will be fine. So just to to point out that this is a different reading. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so someone else can join you, um, team up with you if if someone else is interested. Cool. So everyone will do that on the spreadsheet, and then can I see that spreadsheet too? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Yes. It's, um, it's in the Google Drive folder, and I'm gonna also share it in the Discord. So yes, don't worry about it. Cool. On the Discord, I'll also post there's a little introduction to, I think it was like the, the French translation of his book uh, that's really good and very relevant to our kind of broader topics. So I'll post that in there for you guys too. Um, great. Are there any other like logistical questions? Um, no, you can, you can write it in the spreadsheet. You don't have to say it now. Just um, go ahead and write it in the spreadsheet. And I think we need to have those presentations scheduled by tomorrow or the next day, that's the you know, next day or two. So I would suggest if you have a moment, go ahead and just write your name on there now so you don't have to think about it again later um, on the spreadsheet. Um, and just, yeah, get, get yourself scheduled and then that'll help me think about how we plan all this. But um, yeah, are there any other logistical questions, anything? Otherwise, yeah, the, the syllabus is up there. So we'll just look at the, the urban resilience and infrastructure topics for next week. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always email me or ping me on the discord. Um, otherwise I, I think I'll just see you, uh, same time, same place next week. Great to meet you guys. Have a, have a really wonderful day. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Me. Thanks everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Ciao.